Hello everybody. Welcome to History 311 Online and our lecture for today, World War II, the Arsenal of Democracy and Racial Justice. Now you can use this lecture There we go. You can use this lecture to help you uh, with this week's uh, discussion board post, uh, which asks you to uh, consider the uh, internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, and in particular the uh, Supreme Court case Korematsu versus the United States from 1944. Uh, because I'll do the first half of the lecture today for you uh, that covers Japanese internment. But first, we consider World War II in the memory of the American people, sometimes called the Good War, and no more iconic image uh, that might express the meaning of this uh, than the famous Life magazine photo taken by Alfred Eisenstadt uh, in August of 1945 in New York City's Times Square on the occasion of VJ Day, that is Victory Over Japan Day. And the famous embrace, the famous smooch heard around the world with the American sailor and the American nurse uh, exemplifying the, the pure joy and exultation. One of the things I love about the picture is how everyone around them uh, as part of the procession in Times Square, even this old woman here, you know, sort of standing by and just smiling broadly at this. Uh, we think of other wars in American history, but few, if any, uh, have the emblematic uh, photo that, that just resonates joy the way this one does. When we talk about, for example, uh, say the Vietnam War, uh, we'll look at another very different kind of photo that seemed to imprint itself on the American mindset. And, and so it raises the question, why do we remember wars the way we do? Uh, that is, why do, they, why do they endure in our memories? Uh, or, or in some cases not. In some cases, as they say of the Korean War, become somehow forgotten. Well, I think that if World War I is remembered as the good war, uh, free of the kinds of moral ambiguities that, say, other wars uh, inspire. We saw that in World War I, by the way, with, with the kind of wartime dissent and prosecution of people like Debs and whatnot. Uh, it's not that that doesn't happen in World War II, but by and large, it doesn't happen in a way to define the war as um, as divisive. Uh, America seemed to rally uh, upon hearing the famous address of Franklin Roosevelt from December 7th, 1941, a date which he said would live in infamy. And you listen to or, or read uh, hear the uh, type of language that, that Roosevelt spoke. Always, he said, will our whole nation remember character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people, in their righteous might, will win through to absolute victory. And it's true that Pearl Harbor changed the very tone of, of the political discourse at the time. America, uh, by and large, had stood aloof from the conflict in Europe. There was no great interest on the part of the American people to somehow join this war. And even a few weeks before Pearl Harbor, uh, public opinion polls showed that most Americans were not interested in getting involved. But of course, Pearl Harbor changed all that. And I think Roosevelt's language framed it in a way that made what now is in effect a crusade, or as one administration official quickly put it, a people's war for freedom, uh, made this idea clear that America had no uh, choice but to fight. The illustrator Norman Rockwell captured this in a Saturday Evening Post uh, cover from February of 1943, in which he uh, captured uh, the scenes uh, of American life, as he so often did, kind of draped in small town traditional America, uh, as, as the four freedoms uh, for which Americans were fighting. This was based on a speech that Roosevelt had given in 1941 uh, in which he said that Americans would always fight to to protect their freedom. So uh, a traditional sort of uh, down-home kind of theme uh, 
uh, paired with now the emergency of war. Here's an excerpt from, from Roosevelt's uh, speech uh, from 1941. This is before Pearl Harbor. Uh, freedom of speech and expression, freedom to worship God, freedom from want, freedom uh, from fear. This was now the central defining element of America's uh, effort in World War II. As Roosevelt said famously, we must be the great arsenal of democracy. This, as he put it, would be democracy's fight against world conquest. I want to make it clear that it is the pur purpose of the nation to build now, with all possible speed, every machine, every arsenal, every factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We have the men, the skill, the wealth, and above all, the will. And I think these comments also suggest why uh, Americans remember the war the way they do. Clearly he was talking about an economic revival here, uh, a transition, a transformation really from a depressed nation to a nation, a powerful industrial nation now brimming with industrial production. An industrial production that was a result in, in delivering what he called the great arsenal of democracy. So yeah, World War II, it's true, basically ended the Depression. Most wars create economic havoc, but World War II, by spurring America to, to full employment and, and full production, actually revives the dormant American economy in a way that his New Deal never quite did. And of course, the patriotic imagery that abounds from the war. None more famous uh, than Rosie the Riveter. Uh, and Rosie was emblematic of, of the idea that this was a war that somehow encompassed all of America, including America's uh, women uh, who would now, in time of crisis, uh, contribute to the war effort by taking on jobs typically reserved for males in the factories, the heavy industries, the riveting, the welding, the fabricating, uh, sheet metal, even industries. Uh, the propaganda hides one basic fact, of course, and that it is women had always worked in American factories ever since the very beginning. You might recall the Triangle Factory fire in New York in 1911, uh, whose victims were mostly women. Uh, but this seemed to appeal now to an image of a woman unaccustomed to heavy labor, perhaps middle class, perhaps Caucasian, uh, women, white women from the, uh, the broad middle class who in the Victorian prescription of the day were not expected to work outside the home but now in, in wartime would uh, contribute their labor. So uh, one of the things we need to keep in mind is, is that propaganda during wartime uh, sometimes conceals uh, as much as, as it chooses to reveal. But yet there's no questioning the power of these iconic images. The Marines raising the American flag on the island of Iwo Jima in February of 1945. A desperate battle against the Japanese. A critical turning point in the war in the Pacific. And the initial exultation that followed the raising of this, uh, this American flag. Actually, it was the second uh, take on this picture. They had, they had put up a flag initially, but uh, it seemed to the... Uh, to the military uh, commanders at the time to be perhaps too small. Uh, a larger flag was sent to the top uh, and it was raised uh, and the photograph seen around the world that followed it captured the, uh, as I say, the, the sense of determination, the sense of, of, uh, of desperate sacrifice uh, that America was making in what it uh, perceived as its, its war for freedom, its war for democracy and forever captured in the, uh, the famous monument uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, just across from the nation's capital. I was struck, you know, when I first saw this monument myself, I wasn't prepared for the sheer size of it. I'd, I'd seen pictures and assumed that it was more or less, li more or less uh, life, si life size, but uh, clear, as you can see with the Marines standing as scale in the front, it's, it's far larger uh, than that and really a kind of breathtaking monument. And, and the war seemed to radiate this kind of propaganda, patriotic I embrace. Uh, you know, when Hollywood starts making movies and, and Red, White, and Blue and John Wayne, uh, you, you know the war has captured the imagination of the American people. Again, when we consider Vietnam, we'll see that uh, 
uh, the war movies were quite different. You could probably think of some of them, some you've seen following the Vietnam War that, that really manifested a much darker, or even cynical sort of take on, on the war. But uh, by and large, uh, the World War II movies were, were in that patriotic vein, that patriotic tradition. And, and for many years, continued to be. Uh, Steven Spielberg's take on the D-Day invasions, uh, Saving Private Ryan, a stirring, uh, even epic uh, movie, uh, but but ultimately a poignant movie, but a movie that, that re reaffirmed America's basic mission. Well, let's take a closer look at, at, at the nation to, to begin to move beyond, you know, some of the, the memories. Uh, it, it's it's quite clear that, that, that the government, the federal government, was going to take a different tact in World War II uh, from from what it had done in World War One. Uh, you might recall that the the, the basic thrust of, of the World War One propaganda was to reinforce the idea of of conformity uh, as much as as unity. And I want to explore the difference in in a second. But conformity meaning that in a nation of diverse immigrant populations, there there was a fear that somehow America would not conform to a single standard, that, that our ethnic divisions would create disloyalties. And that's created a climate of, of repression, as we saw with Eugene Debs, who was given a 10-year sentence for, for critical remarks uh, toward the war. Well, I think it left a bitter taste in the, the mouth of the American people. And I, I think that, uh, that even World War I was remembered, you know, two decades later by those who had lived through it as, as perhaps a something of a mistake. Uh, public opinion polls suggest that as many as two-thirds of the American public believe that our involvement in World War I had been a mistake. And I think that's part of the reason, uh, the sense of division and, and paranoia and, and uh, disloyalty, etc. But the government takes a different stance here. United we win. This doesn't smack so much of conformity as it does of unity. And it goes so far as to show two defense workers you know, uh, riveting a, a fuselage here of an airplane, one white and one black, shoulder to shoulder. But we might call uh, this into question as a depiction of, of, of reality, as, as, as we'll see, because we know that since Reconstruction, America had been mired in a racial caste system, a system of racial segregation upheld by the Supreme Court, separate but equal, as it was called. And, uh, and we're going to want to look past some of the images that the government used, I think, to frame the conflict. Images like this, you see here uh, dignitaries meeting in New York City. That's Mayor LaGuardia uh, standing in the center with a, with a hat, uh, surrounded by uh, various religious leaders and others. Uh, a, a, a billboard unveiled uh, here showing the American GI side by side. It says Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, so that every person, may worship God in his own way. So if it was a people's war for freedom, it was a, a people's war for all freedoms, religious freedoms, diverse beliefs, uh, racial equality, etc. At least looking at the, uh, at the propaganda at the time. But we know that in at least one basic sense, um, that, that, that fear of, of, of disloyalty and that climate of repression uh, quickly, quickly coalesced in regard uh, to the uh, the population of Japanese Americans, and and we're going to talk a bit about this for the rest of this uh, portion of the lecture. Public anger over the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor will fuel terrific anti-Japanese sentiment, really even eclipsing the anti-German sentiment uh, from from World War II, uh, though though perhaps more similar to the anti-German sentiment in World War One, It really takes front and center stage uh, in America's emotional response, and obviously Pearl Harbor was the trigger mechanism for that. The fact that it was as defined as a sneak attack, a dastardly attack, as President Roosevelt said, seemed to, to make the uh, enmity even stronger. And we talk about anger against the Japanese nation. Uh, very early in the war, uh, incidents like the uh, infamous Bataan Death March, which saw American troops uh, put on a force march uh, through the Philippines by the Japanese military, uh, brutalized, starved, suffering. Uh, the Death March, as it was known, would uh, define America's anger uh, toward the Japanese uh, military, uh, 
the Japanese nation, but one also wonders here, the poster, the murdering Jap, Jap will become a term of racial epithet, a term, a slur, a term of, of abuse, but it was really just the, you know, the shortened version of, of Japanese, and yet it takes on its own, its own meaning. Again, back to FDR's war message. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked, he said, suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. There was something particularly underhanded, it seemed, in the way that Japan had, had a, a, attacked the United States. And this translates into terrific anger, as I said, really ultimately against all things Japanese, what we might call the demonizing of all things Japanese. Uh, the Japanese weren't just an enemy, they were, they were somehow subhuman. And Collier's Magazine, a national magazine in America, on the occasion of the Pearl Harbor anniversary, shows a caricature of the Japanese pilot looking more like one of the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz, which had premiered only two years earlier. A uh, kind of bat-like, demonic creature with fangs and ghoulish expression. And it's no coincidence that uh, as these images become normal during the war, I mean you even get Warner Brother cartoons, right? Maybe I'll fish one off the internet for you guys, uh, showing uh, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck taking on the Japanese, um, that you get at that same time you get a backlash here in the United States, uh, in the nation that brought you the you know Jim Crow and, and signs of, of racial segregation and and no Irish need apply and that sort of thing. I guess it shouldn't be surprising that signs went up, particularly here on the West Coast, signs posted around saying, we don't want any Japs here, ever. And I think it's revealing any Japs must have implied not only formally Japanese people from Japan, but those of Japanese descent living in the United States. Well, I, I don't have Bugs Bunny for you just yet, but I do have Dr. Seuss. Uh, propaganda fueled by racist perceptions now. Dr. Seuss, uh, an illustrator during World War II, will help pen some sort of nationalistic, anti-Japanese, uh, anti-Japanese American uh, cartoons. Uh, the Honorable Fifth Column here referenced what was purportedly an entire population of Japanese uh, people in the United States who were eager and willing now to assist the nation of Japan in their attack on America. They're, they're lining up all the way to Washington and along the California coast in the cartoon, ready to take up TNT uh, as, uh, as weapons against the country uh, in which they reside. Uh, one can't help but think of you know the cat in the hat or, or more benign Dr. Seuss cartoons, but uh, seeing here the unmistakable imprint uh, of a kind of r racial caricature uh, that formed the basis of these drawings. And true enough, within a month or so of Pearl Harbor, the military was already issuing its famous civilian exclusion orders, uh, calling upon all people of Japanese ancestry, or as they put it, Japanese blood, which was defined, by the way, as having at least one grandparent of Japanese descent calling on all such people to uh, to prepare to remove themselves, to evacuate from their homes and businesses and schools for transportation and relocation in so-called internment camps. Some folks were given as little as, as 24 hours to prepare uh, to basically make um, to make arrangements for all their earthly possessions because whether they be homes or farms or, or businesses, what have you, uh, all you could all you could take with you is what you could carry. Obviously, all weapons must be turned in. I say obviously because the military is, is depicting uh, people of Japanese ancestry here now as a military threat to the United States. So all weapons, including even ceremonial samurai blades, had to be turned in, and, and even radios, so that there would be no possibility of somehow communicating or getting uh, news information. Ultimately, as you may know, um, quite a large number of, of people were in, in turn. These are civilians, people of Japanese descent, and upwards of 127,000 of them were ultimately interned. The word is interned, but really they were imprisoned, as we'll see, under a military order. I was born and raised here, said Jim Tanaka, a Sacramento area resident. We lost everything, said Mr. Tanaka, whose family had a farm and grew strawberries in the Florin area of South Sacramento.
he remembered being patted down and, and his family being patted down, uh, mom and dad and sisters and brothers by FBI men, and then given a number. He said it looked like a, a price tag as they were uh, preparing now to move out uh, to what would be their home for the remainder of the war. And the map here shows uh, that the military had staked several locations throughout the western part of the country, really stretching as far east as Arkansas, but mostly in the sort of central core of the west, from the Gila River of Arizona to the west central desert of Utah, the Topaz Camp, uh, to Manzanar here in, uh, in our own state, uh, down near Bishop. Uh, California near the Nevada uh, California border these were uh, uh, isolated uh, for the most part uh, locations desolate hard to reach certainly out of the mainstream in Utah the Topaz camp uh, which was uh, built from scratch near uh, the town of Delta think highway 50 if you took highway 50 across Utah you would run smack dab into Delta where 8,000 civilians men women and children of Japanese descent uh, a majority of them, by the way, born in the United States. I should have mentioned that of the 127,000 or so, uh, more than 70,000 were native-born Americans. Um, 8,000 were interned here at, at Delta and the Topaz Camp, making it the uh, the fifth largest Utah city during the war. Told by the Army, we were, bearing, we were being protected against angry civilians, said Jim Tanaka, yet we noticed that the machine guns pointed inward, uh, as did the barbed wire. Make no mistake, this was a military prison with Army-built barracks, standard stuff, one light bulb, mattresses stuffed with hay, no indoor plumbing, no heating, no cooling. Uh, this was uh, a place not to be terribly comfortable, but a place to be made the best of by all those uh, who entered. And so they did, because uh, they were anxious uh, to demonstrate their loyalty. You know, traditions of honor uh, and family run deep throughout Japanese history and culture. And Japanese Americans in inherited those traditions. And, and many were quite embarrassed, if not humiliated, at the very uh, suggestion that somehow they uh, weren't uh, trustworthy. Uh, they, they, they weren't to be trusted. And so while in the camps, you know, most tried to demonstrate their commitment to American ways of life, uh, posing for pictures in American uh, ways in front of here, the barber shop, uh, maintaining gardens, uh, arts and crafts, even even baseball teams, flag raising ceremonies, you know, Cub Scout troops, uh, all going on inside the camps. The kids were asked to recite the Pledge of Allegiance while in the camp schools. It wasn't until I was growing up, remembered Alice Harai, who was only three years old when her family interned at uh, Topaz, that I realized we had gone to prison. We went without a trial and without due process. I was angry for a long time. But her anger really came later in life because as a child, it was beyond her. She recalled seeing uh, the Walt Disney uh, animated uh, epic Snow White shown one evening in the camp on a reel-to-reel -reel film projector. It must have seemed almost like a, a kind of uh, adventure to the young, to the very young, but to their parents and to the uh, to the mature, elderly among them, it was it was quite astonishing and 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 quite disheartening, and as I said earlier, even humiliating. One chance to to find some kind of redemption, you know. Uh, keep, keep in mind because you're going to hear things and read things particularly in the Supreme Court's, uh, you know, uh, opinions on, on the case of Fred Korematsu. The simple fact is that all of this was done preemptively uh, following Pearl Harbor. In other words, there were no actual cases of sabotage, no acts of terror committed here in the United States by people of Japanese descent. Uh, but the military supposed there might be, and uh, there were plenty of rumors and, and intelligence that said that there may be cells of you know, disloyal or, or co collaborators, uh, you know, that that in fact not, nothing was su substantively re ever recovered. Um, this was done not as a result of those things, but in anticipation of those things. And so, you know, for many uh, in the camps, it, it meant finding some some avenue for redemption uh, now when the war started about 5,000 Japanese Americans were already in the military 
the army quickly took away their guns, gave them jobs as, as custodians. They weren't even allowed to work in the kitchens for fear of, of poisoning uh, or, or gaining, uh, you know, weapons. But it, but it didn't stop the young men in the camps from wanting to demonstrate their, their patriotism, their commitment to country, their willingness to sacrifice. And after a lot of uh, political lobbying, uh, the military finally relented and allowed for an all-Japanese-American uh, combat uh, regiment, uh, the 442nd Combat Regiment, to be organized. Uh, these men would fight exclusively in Europe as part of a, uh, a segregated uh, troop, uh, commanded, by the way, by non-Japanese-American uh, officers. Uh, you had to sign a loyalty oath, you had to forswear allegiance uh, to Japan, and, and if you uh, were drafted, because the, the military actually began to draft soldiers into the 442nd right, right out of the camps, if you were to say no, you were essentially stripped of your citizenship. But in the end, over 14,000 uh, men said yes, and what came to be known as the Go for Broke uh, Battalion would distinguish itself like, well, really like none others uh, during the war. Uh, because at the end of, uh, of of the war, of all the American combat regiments of similar size, it was the 442nd that had received most commendations uh, for bravery, over 18,000 commendations for, for bravery. And I, and I think this, this was a reflection both of, of the determination of the men in the 442nd to, to, to demonstrate their, their patriotism, but it was, it was also, I think, the result of the, the fact that the military often put the 442nd directly in, in, in harm's way, even beyond what, what other regiments experienced. As, as Jim Tanaka, who served in the 442nd, said, we, we were expendable. And you can kind of get a sense of why he, he felt that way, particularly after the so-called Lost Battalion episode, which saw an American regiment pinned down in the Alps under German withering fire from German artillery, uh, essentially becoming stranded and, and, and just devastated. Uh, the 442nd uh, was ordered to send in uh, several, uh, several companies of men uh, to retrieve the so-called lost battalion of Americans and and remarkably under enormously difficult situations uh, fighting in the mountains uh, fighting against uh, you know better uh, emplaced uh, enemy guns you know literally uphill uh, the men of the 442nd managed to save the 214 survivors of the lost battalion despite suffering over 800 uh, casualties and, and, and wounded and killed soldiers themselves. So a disproportionate number, it would seem, uh, to, to give 800 in order to save 200. No wonder Mr. Tanaka felt uh, that they were perceived as expendable by the military high command. You might find it interesting that for all the medals won by the men of the 442nd, that during the war itself and for years afterward, the military refused to award the highest medal, that is the Congressional Medal of Honor. It took half a century for the military to reverse itself and to open up its records and to scrutinize them carefully. And when it did, ultimately 22 veterans from the 442nd, 22 received the Medal of Honor. This is, this is extraordinary. Uh, in the last decade of, of, of war that America has fought, in the Afghanistan and in Iraq, we've seen Medal of Honors uh, awarded, but and I haven't kept track, uh, but to my recollection, about a half dozen uh, or so, and there, and there may be more. I, I know the first given to a, a living uh, recipient uh, here a couple of years ago, and, and another one recently. But in, in any event. Uh, it's not to, to disparage the, the great sacrifice of our troops in, in recent wars. Uh, far from it. It's to uh, draw you know, attention to what was the extraordinary sacrifice of this one regiment uh, that it would uh, eventually win 22 uh, medals of honor. Uh, Shizuya Hayashi was a U.S. Army private and, and still living when uh, he was awarded uh, 50 years after the fact, awarded uh, his medal of honor. Uh, his, his battle record uh, uh, indicated that he had charged a German machine gun position uh, on one occasion, killing nine enemy soldiers 
before taking four others prisoner. And for that, in June of 2000, uh, Private Hayashi was awarded the, uh, the Medal of Honor. Those of you who live in the Sacramento region might be interested to know that uh, a stretch of highway uh, along Highway 99 heading south to Stockton is, uh, is known today as the, the commemorative uh, uh, 442nd uh, Gopher Broke Battalion uh, Highway. And as we'll see, uh, the, uh, the questions only uh, went deeper when it came to basic issues of, of racial justice. Uh, during the war, but I wanted to just uh, give you at least this first part of the lecture today before we come back to part two next time uh, so that you would have some context for uh, for thinking and reading about uh, the Kodamatsu case, which is the uh, uh, the uh, the basis for your discussion board, as I said uh, this week. All right, so that's all for now. We'll see you again in, in part two.